Yes, they related them back to what the patient told them, or in this case, what individuals who were undergoing experimental pain told them. So it's always going to come back to something people tell us. It's, it's an internal, subjective experience. I believe that offers many advantages. Right? It's important to recognize that self-report measures of pain are reliable and valid. That's been shown many, many times in many different ways. Patients are able to tell us how much pain they're in. It's also a lot cheaper to ask somebody how much pain they're in than it is to put them in a scanner. Uh, I can also do it over the phone or send somebody a questionnaire, right? We can do large population-based studies in a, a very cost-effective manner because of pain's nature uh, as a subjective experience. And the other thing is, I don't know of any patients who have come to the clinic saying, you know, my interior cingulate is lighting up a bit much for me, Doc. Can you help me with that? No, they come to the clinic saying, I'm hurting, I'm suffering, my quality of life is diminished. And so by asking patients how they feel and basing our treatments on that, we're validating the patient's experience. So there are advantages here. Now another challenge I've mentioned is that pain is actively modulated in the central nervous system. Uh, you can see here uh, in blue, there's sort of the northbound transmission of pain from uh, peripheral receptors into the dorsal horn, up through the midbrain, uh, and into various cortical regions. And then there's the descending controls, the brain initiates descending modulation of pain. That modulation can increase the experience of pain, amplify the experience of pain, or that modulation can inhibit or reduce the experience of pain. And then if we get into the brain, there's an awful lot of activity within the brain itself that actively sculpts the experience of pain. Because of this very active modulation of pain, it's impossible to predict from a painful stimulus how much pain the person's actually going to experience. Okay? It's important to recognize that in this modulation of pain, particularly by the central nervous system, psychological fa factors play a, a large role. A variety of psychological factors, context, mood, cognitive set, all impact central nervous system pathways that are involved in creating the experience of pain. And that leads us to one of the other translational challenges, which is the biopsychosocial nature of pain. The very experience of pain is sculpted by complex and dynamic interactions among biological factors, psychosocial factors, we act as though these are different things, but they're really not. It's more the level of analysis that we apply. Uh, they interact quite strongly and in ways that we don't fully understand. It makes pain a challenge, but it also gives us a number of avenues that we can pursue with our translational research. And so I've thought about the idea of translational bridges. Right? If we're going to successfully translate our findings across the spectrum of translational research, that is, if we're going to go from pain mechanisms to effective pain treatment, we need bridges that will connect those different areas of research. And I think of several different bridges that can be exploited in pain research. I'll talk quite a bit about laboratory pain testing or quantitative sensory testing since that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Uh, and included in some of the studies I'll talk to you about are uh, brain imaging, genetics, biopsychosocial uh, studies that try to incorporate the various translational challenges and opportunities I've already described to you. 
So quantitative sensory testing, what is that? Well, here's my definition. Quantitative sensory testing is the assessment of perceptual and or physiological responses to systematically applied and quantifiable sensory stimuli for the purpose of characterizing somatosensory function or dysfunction. Okay, and I'll give you uh, a few examples here. We can use a variety of stimulus modalities so we can induce pain in any number of ways and we can measure a variety of responses and I'll show you some data with these different types of responses. Okay. Uh, so for example, here's my kids. Uh, <laughs> It must be great having a dad who's a pain researcher. So, so this is our, our thermal pain stimulus here. So we apply contact heat to the arm. The individual can register their response by pressing a button, or we can ask for verbal responses. Uh, here's our ischemic pain test. We include the blood pressure cuff here. Uh, that restricts blood flow creating a deep aching pain in the arm because uh, there's an exercise stimulus here. Now you may be thinking, what's a guy my age doing with kids this age? Well, they didn't stay this age, right? They've grown up now uh, and turn about is fair play. So I, I can't quite strap them into the lab like I used to, but uh, we had fun back in the day. So that's quantitative sensory testing. We apply, uh, in, in my lab, we apply primarily painful stimuli. We assess uh, perceptual responses and sometimes other responses. Uh, and one point I'd like to make is that quantitative sensory testing is clinically relevant, right? Now, what I do to people in the lab is not the same as having chronic low back pain. Right? But it is relevant in that it, uh, it draws on the same pain processing systems that are involved in processing other types of somatic pain study. We're doing a study uh, on osteoarthritis, knee osteoarthritis. Uh, we've uh, perpetrated several forms of pain testing on these folks. Um, here's a brief sort of summary slide of some of the demographic and clinical characteristics of our sample. We divided them for purposes of analysis into patients who had knee OA and high levels of clinical pain, and that was based on a median split of the graded chronic pain scale. Uh, so 50 or above would be high levels of pain, uh, and below 50 would be low levels of pain. And of course, that's reflected on the WOMAC too. Okay? Uh, and then we have a control group of people who don't have any symptoms of knee osteoarthritis. And, and so I'm going to show you some comparisons of quantitative sensory testing findings for these three groups. So here are heat pain thresholds and tolerances. Uh, we apply the stimulus both to the arm and to the most affected knee uh, or to a matched knee if there are controls. And what we see in particular is that the osteoarthritis patients who have high levels of pain uh, have lower heat pain thresholds and tolerances than the other two groups. That is, they're more sensitive. It, it requires less stimulation to evoke pain in these individuals. And it doesn't matter whether we're applying it to the arm or to the knee. In fact, for heat pain threshold, their knee was no different. So this is a generalized change in pain processing, not one that's specific to the site where they have clinical pain. These are pressure pain thresholds applied to the medial and lateral joint line of the most affected knee the ipsilateral quadriceps muscle, and then the trapezius uh, muscle in the lateral epicondyle area. Uh, and again, we're seeing a similar pattern of results. The thresholds are the lowest for the OA patients who have the most clinical pain. Uh, sometimes the uh, low pain OA patients differ from controls such as here and here, but sometimes they don't. So they're sort of in between the high pain OA patients and the control. So uh, OA patients, particularly those with high levels of pain, are more sensitive to heat, more sensitive to pressure. We also apply a mechanical stimulus with a von Frey hair, a nylon monofilament, a fairly stiff one. We poke people once and we say, how painful was that? It doesn't hurt 
very much. Uh, this was on a 0 to 100 scale. And then we poke them 10 times, once a second, and we say, well, what was your peak pain during that? And that slope that you see there reflects temporal summation of mechanical pain. See, the stimulus itself wasn't changing, but because of the repeated stimulation, uh, it becomes more painful most likely because of changes in how the central nervous system is processing the stimulus rather than the peripheral nervous system. And what we see for our high pain OA patients is they're more sensitive to one stimulus, but they also show more robust temporal summation of pain, and that's true whether we're testing their knee or their hand. Okay. So they have more robust temporal summation of mechanical pain. They also have more robust temporal summation of heat pain. These are uh, five heat pain stimuli uh, applied and this is on the hand I believe um, or, or the volar forearm and what we see is that OA patients provide higher ratings overall but this slope is actually steeper as well so high OA pain is associated with uh, a broad-based, generalized, increased sensitivity to painful stimuli, no matter what the painful stimulus and no matter where we put it. Okay? And this is in contradistinction to the historical view of OA as a very specific regional disorder that's restricted to that site of pain. And one of the other things, so QST is clinically relevant, one of the things that's often done with quantitative sensory testing is research to help us understand more about individual differences in pain. Right? And what are individual differences? Well, there are differences between people in something important. Right? And here's an example of individual differences. These are data from a study some time ago now where patients underwent a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, there, let's look at six hours post-surgery, right? Median pain is about 50 out of 100 on a visual analog scale. Every little dot you see is a patient. You have patients populating the entire continuum of pain. Some patients reported no pain at six hours. Some patients reported pain of 100 out of 100 at six hours. And there were patients everywhere along the way. So if you're the provider about to do this lap coli on a patient, the patient says, well, how painful is this going to be? <laughs> you're likely to say, on average, people report it about 50 out of 100. If you were honest, you'd say, I have no clue. <laughs> you're going to have somewhere between no pain and pain that you can't possibly tolerate. Okay? These are individual differences in pain. Of course, there are many factors that can drive these differences. There can be subtle differences in the tissue damage done by the surgery. There can be differences in the pathology that the patient has. There can be differences in response to perioperative pain management, right? And that's where quantitative sensory testing comes in, where we take healthy young adults in this particular slide, uh, 321 of them, and we apply a 48 degree thermal stimulus to their volar forearm, exact same stimulus, for every individual. And we asked them to rate how painful that was from zero to 100. A few patients say, not very painful at all, maybe five. Each line is a person, right? So these individual differences are not restricted to clinical pain. They're certainly observed in the laboratory. And so if somebody asks me, well, how painful is a 48 degree stimulus? I'm gonna give them the same answer somewhere between not at all and excruciating, right? Are individual differences in pain real? Some people tend to suspect these are just differences in reporting behavior. So this is a nice study done by Bob Coghill's group several years ago where they identified people sort of on this end of the continuum and people on this end of the continuum. They used a 49 degree heat stimulus. So they had people who were high sensitive and low sensitive, and then they put them in the functional MRI scanner and looked at how their brains responded when experiencing the same stimulus. Uh, and you see greater activation in several pain-related brain regions in the high sensitive group compared to the low sensitive group, particularly somatosensory cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and uh, prefrontal cortex. 
And so their brains are agreeing with their self-report. Their brain response to that stimulus was more robust if they were more sensitive. A very recent paper from uh, Cog Hill's group um, actually looked at gray matter density, that is the thickness of your cortex, and whether that predicts, not in response to anything, just walking around, how thick is your cortex in several brain regions, how does that correlate with how painful you find a 49 degree heat stimulus? And in several brain regions, cortical thickness was negatively related to how painful the stimulus was. The, the sort of general model of pain that I operate from and that I think is heuristic <coughs> suggests that there are genetic factors that contribute to pain. I think in part they operate through psychological and biological processes, some of which drive altered pain processing and some of which may contribute to chronic pain in other ways. All of these factors can be influenced by a variety of effect modifiers. I didn't talk to you about race, but we've done a lot of work in that area too. Uh, but sex, age, and race could influence all of these factors and can interact with these factors in driving pain. And of course, environmental exposures. If I have a high pain sensitive genotype and I'm a catastrophizer, but I'm lucky enough to go through life never having any trauma or anything bad happen to me, I may never develop chronic pain. Okay? Um, and, and so all of these factors are important to consider. So I think we have multiple methods and approaches that can facilitate translational pain research. And I've shown you some of the QST data, the brain imaging data, the genetic data uh, that can represent translational bridges. And, and by the way, I refer to them as bridges because they can easily link preclinical and clinical models. We can do the same brain imaging in anim animals that we do in humans. We can do very similar lab laboratory pain testing in animals as in humans and so on and so forth. Um, translational pain research to be effective has to address all of the biopsychosocial mechanisms that may contribute to chronic pain. This has been generally lacking from our preclinical studies, our discovery research, okay, but we need to incorporate this. Uh, T3, T4 pain research, implementation research. Why don't providers uh, implement guidelines? Okay? Why don't providers practice evidence-based medicine? Is it that we don't have the evidence, or that the healthcare system doesn't allow that, or what? We need, if we could get the safe and effective therapies that are currently available to the patients who need them, we could dramatically reduce the magnitude of chronic pain as a public health problem, but we're not doing it. Okay. Uh, and so we need to work on that. Um, and I think the key is interdisciplinary translational efforts and that will lead to significant improvements uh, in the epidemic of chronic pain. I'd certainly like to thank uh, many of the colleagues who've worked with me over the years on some of the work I showed you. Uh, we also uh, are thankful for the support we get from our CTSA, University of Florida, as well as from various funding agencies uh, at NIH. And I thank you for your attention.